and welcome to a very special episode of Life of Die. I'm your regular host, Gordon, and today I'm delighted to be joined once again by friend of the show and all-round gaming legend, Andy Chambers. Hello, Andy. How are you doing? Hi there, Gordon. It's lovely to be back on again. Looking forward to our chat today. Yeah, absolutely. So for anybody that missed it, Andy was on our podcast last year and he gave us a, an informative and entertaining insight into the creation of both the Strontium Dog and Judge Dread Miniatures games, both of which are published by Warlord Games. If you haven't already listened to that, please check it out first because it tells you the whole evolution of this uh, series of games that have been produced for Warlord. But if you already have, this is a perfect podcast to pick up the story as Andy's here to talk about the latest 2000D game to be adapted for the tabletop, Slain, which I believe people have just started receiving in the last week. Is that right, Andy? Uh, that's right. It's been on pre-order for a little while and I think they're being shipped out now. I'm not Warlord mail order by the way, so don't <laughs> ask me where your game is. But I've seen stuff about people receiving their games, and they seem very happy. They like miniatures a lot, which is always nice. You know, how they feel about the game system usually takes a little while longer to emerge. <laughs> but it looks really good. I must say, the, the Slain rulebook in particular is a lovely piece of work. That's Paul Sawyer and his guys over at Wall of doing 2000 AD Proud again. Yeah, and they've done it all the way through the, the series. Mm. So I suppose going back to the start here again, Referring back to that previous podcast, after Strontium Dog, it, it seemed, you know, a bit of a no-brainer that Dread was going to be the next one to be adapted. But once that was done, I'm guessing this time around, and with so many great strips to choose from, the decision as to which 2000 AD property to adapt must have been a tough one. I was wondering if you'd be able to share the reasons why, particularly when another science fiction game may have been the easier option for you as designers, that Slain was the one that you opted for. It would have been way easier. Uh, at the end of the day, Strontium Dog and Judge Red use the same system, and it, it's basically a sci-fi gunfight skirmish system, is what it's set up to do best. But the idea had always been there that it was supposed to be a universal system that would, you know, could be applied to any one of a number of different comic strips. So some of it was challenge, mm -hmm. that, you know, wanted to put the money where the mouth was, that we can actually do that. Some of it was that actually when you look across 2008's titles and the promotional stuff they do for themselves and so on about who do they put on their sort of like, here's our big heroes covers and posters and things like that. Just Dread's always on there, yeah, for certain. Not always Johnny Alpha, truth be told. Strontium Dogs are a bit more second string. The other particularly big hero that you always see is Slain. And that... Slain's got this, this sort of curious history of being a, a fantasy strip in a sci-fi comic, which is a rarity in itself, and the fantasy strips in fantasy comic strips in general are, are pretty rare things. So it's fairly unique, uh, and it's very British, because uh, it's you know deeply rooted in, well, say British, Irish mythology more than anything else, British Isles. So it, it was an interesting challenge to take on, and it would be a very starkly different set of miniatures, obviously, to come out with a fantasy miniatures. And having done a couple of sci-fi titles, it felt like it would keep things fresher rather than doing... Because, I mean, there are some obvious candidates when it comes to sci-fi gunfights of one kind or another. You've got Rogue Trooper, you've got ABC Warriors. They were both fit the milieu really easily. Nemesis the Warlock, not quite so easily, but you kind of get in there. So Slain was really kind of like left field. But it felt like it would be a good opportunity to shake things up a bit, try something very different using the same system. So, in other words, we created a rod for our own backs. <laughs> So, well, before you actually get into the rules then, I'm guessing that you would have had, a bit like you had to do with Strontium Dog and Judge Dredd, you would have had a, a lot of reading to do <laughs> again, because obviously Slain definitely has a, a richer history, I would say, than Strontium Dog, because there was a big gap after the classic years of Strontium Dog, there was a revival some time later, but Slain... Slain has been a perennial, he's been there throughout and gone through a lot of different artists over the years as well. So quite a number of different art styles associated with it. And that's always part of the challenge is, all right, what kind of style? I mean, we'd, we'd run into it with Judge Dredd, obviously, as well, where you just have to you know, stick a pin in it in a few places and say the style of lawgivers, those style of uh, lawmasters, because there's been you know a dozen down the years, really. So with Slain, yeah, early Slain is, is kind of a bit of a defining Slain, which is a very black and white, scratchy period for Mike McCart. And then later on, you get these sumptuous, uh, full-colour, beautiful slain books. You get onto the Book of Invasions and stuff like that. So, yeah, we primarily used as our source the Horned God, 
graphic novels. But we also, you know, took a long, hard look at all the old strips. But again, I was working with Gav and Paul Sawyer, and we're all fans of 2000 AD, so we all kind of knew the strips already. So it was more of a refresher round than anything else to go back and have a look at them. And I say, a fairly deep dive on the Horned Gods specifically, since that was what we were going to use as our sort of like our framework for it. Is Horned God your kind of favourite of the storylines? Certainly the one that's, uh, I know 2000 AD pushes hardest in terms of like reprints and so on. The Horned God comes up a lot and it's... It's beautiful. The artworks for it are amazing, absolutely amazing throughout. The, the story, the story is a story. It's very much in the, the sort of like mythic cycle kind of stage of slain. If I'm honest, I kind of prefer the earlier stuff when it, he's a bit more of a vagabond wandering around with Oko the Dwarf and getting into scrapes rather than later on when he's High King. But, you know, he's got that full hero's journey character arc going on, so, you know, it's inevitable it ends up there. But in terms of story, yeah, I kind of enjoy the earlier ones more than the later ones, but I can't say that the Horned God is um, a disappointing read at all. There's a great stuff in there, some marvellous ideas in particular. So each has its own benefits, but, yeah, deep in my heart of hearts, I, I'm early on. First introduction of Slain, really, when, once again, when I was... Still on, on the schoolyard reading my 2000 ADs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm much the same myself. I like that. I think there's actually quite a few of the, the fans feel that it should stop, that it should have stopped at the Horn God. But certainly, yeah, to me, I think it probably is. There's that nostalgia aspect as well. I was the same, I was at school and stuff. And I like that black and white phase of 2000 AD. That to me is a classic phase. And so, yeah, I have no argument with you there. <laughs> <laughs> I think for anybody that's seen the miniatures, it seems fairly clear that you are leaning towards the, the fantasy elements of the strip. But I was wondering, I was kind of curious to know if there'd been any temptation at all to set the game in the Time Killer arc, because the heroes were running around at that point with, with uh, laser guns. <laughs> and it, it just to me, it seemed like that would be the more easy and natural fit, I suppose, for what you'd already created, because those other games were focused on that kind of range combat and exotic technologies. It's true, it's true. And, and so was it a temptation? To... <laughs> Not really. No, no. We, we discussed specifically laser weapons, and for those listening at home, this is laser spelled L-E-Y-S-E-R, like ley lines, you see, magic laser guns. We kind of talked about it and discarded it as an idea quite early on, because that's not really slain, is the thing. It was an entertaining arc and something quite different, it must be said. I was actually a, a big fan of the Choose Your Own Adventure that they did at the same time as that the whole time killer thing. As 2000 AD sort of like got into doing some basic games as well, based around that concept. But at the end of the day, it's not classic slain, really. It's um, it's this sort of like strange, you know, sci fantasy adventure that they go on into a different place with you know Merlin the Wizard and all the rest of it. But it's it does sit very much apart from the rest of the slain strips when you look over them in general. So. We kind of, you know, maybe an expansion set. Uh, I mean, we did use Elfric because he's a really good villain and he reoccurs so much throughout Slain in the latter years in particular and he's a good foil for Slain. So we did use him as a villain, but generally we stayed away from the, the, the super metacosmic stuff like the Time Killer arc. Fair enough, no problem with that. So obviously that meant that Slain was going to be a bit different to those other games. Before we get into those key differences, I thought we should start with what the similarities were between the two systems. For example, is there continuity between the previous games and Slain in relation to the use of the likes of 2000 AD combat dice, single and double actions, and chips and star chips for uh, activating characters? Yes, all of that stays exactly the same. And we never even messed with that because that's the strongest sort of like theme that goes throughout them all is the activation system of the star chips and the normal chips, everything going in a bag, single and double actions. So that carries across entirely. I started out, I actually, the first pass through, I actually changed the stat lines a little bit, and, you know, putting courage instead of cool and things like that. But actually having seen the reception that Judge Dredd got and how people valued to be honest, the similarities between the two systems, and it's just like, all oh, right, if I know one, I know both. I decided that was a bad route to go down, so I sort of consciously made sure the stat lines just work the same, and they work on the same paradigm. I don't really expect people to put Judge Dread up against Slain, but I'm sure somebody will somewhere. <laughs> At the end of the day, they, they work on the same kind of characteristic levels as muties and judges and stuff like that. So, you know, Slain is a, a mighty hero don't get me wrong, but his stats aren't massively out of whack with, say, somebody like Judge Dredd. So all of that kind of stays the same. A lot of the weaponry works very much like it does 
in as far as it goes, in just trying to, at least melee weapons and things like that, you know, they give you bonuses to your fight and things for having uh, big melee weapons and so on. So a lot of that carried across, but we had to obviously do a lot more work with melee weapons and review the uh, ranged weapons quite a lot to get it down to, you know, bows and repeating crossbows and javelins and things like that. So missile combat is there, and it works very similar to the way that it works in Just Dread and Strange Dog. But it's, it's kind of a, a lot less effectual. You know, the power on it tends to be very, very low. For missile weapons, the big place where we made any change in the end, well, there's two big places we made changes in the end, was the close combat, because obviously we were anticipating a lot of it, a lot, a lot of it. You know, probably about two-thirds of the panels in Slain Strips are him wading through close combat, you know, jumping on people's shields and splitting their skulls and declaring that it is not too many. <laughs> So clearly we want to do more with close combat. And the other thing was the, um, you know, what we do with the armory cards and the big meg or chicanery cards, depending on whether you're talking about Judge Tread or uh, Strontium Dog, the little card extras that we give you. Because the armory cards in particular will come up to deal with a very specific problem of like having characters, heroes that had occasional special powers bad guys too, where they could throw a time bomb or fire a, a heat seeker or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we put them onto cards and you, you got dealt some and that's, you know, the hand you got. Nothing really like that occurs in Slain. There's nothing comparable. There's no special weapon that he pulls out on a special occasion to defeat something. It's all about mighty feats of arms and pretty much through all of it he's just using the same axe as well. There's no weapon variation at all for him, really. So armory cards weren't going to work clearly. And when it came to the, the sort of the, the big meg or chicanery card, it's like, well, we need magic of a sort. Because, you know, there are sorcerers, the the sour magic spells that get used can be quite nasty, and the earth magic spells can be quite beneficial and so forth. And you do see it happen in the strips, particularly during big battles. So we clearly needed some sort of magic system in there. So that was one half of the cards. The other half of the cards Eventually, we plugged it straight back into the close combat system because what we wanted for the close combat system is we used a, a system of opposed dice rolling rather than just I roll to hit you and I roll to hurt you. You are actually rolling off against each other and comparing your number of hits, your number of shield results, and so on. So, like old school uh, Warhammer combat in a way. Interesting. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, we wanted both sides to be participating when it came to the close combat, but. So, you, you know, you're both rolling your combat dice. Obviously, somebody really powerful like Slain can generally overwhelm somebody lesser and beat them around the head quite hard. <laughs> so the other part of the cards came down to doing, like, heroic feat cards, which are cards that you can play in close combat and will give you a bonus to your close combat. So you might have the headbutt card that gives you, you know, an extra hit result or something like that, or lets you roll an extra fight dice. And so when you're in close combat, you can commit... Essentially, all of your feet cards, you know, heroes tend to have like one, two, or three feet cards as a rule of thumb into that combat. And they also have like a, a bonus trigger on them where if you roll the right numbers on your dice for the close combat, so the bonus trigger might be something like uh, two hits and a special. So if you get two hits and a special on your dice rolls, there's an extra, extra effect that kicks in as well. So for headbutt, it might be something like, you know, your opponent will automatically be stunned in addition to any other results. So you got a bit more character coming through in the close combat at that point, because, you know, if you're fighting another hero, they've got their feet cards that they can play as well. Some of them are more defensively oriented, you know, will give you extra shield results and all extra resistance and things like that. So you've got some card interplay starting to go on. And over the course of, you know, you can use them on your activation or you can use them defensively when, they're, uh, when somebody else is attacking you. But you only get one use of each feet card per turn. So once you use it, you just flip it over, and then once the little chips go back in the pot, you get your feet cards back again, so you can use them in the next round. All right, okay, that's a big change because obviously once they're done, they're done in the other systems. So yeah, that's there's obviously a lot more emphasis on the the cards being played in this game than certainly they were important in the other games. I'm not trying to say otherwise. <laughs> no, and the, well, they're, they're they're less super powerful because the other games are so. They, they, I mean, they vary in strength an awful lot, but a lot of the um, armory, chicanery, and big mech cards can be, you know, they can be game changers uh, in and of themselves. Mm. Feats are less like that. Feats are more of a sort of like, it's a bonus that you can throw in that, that uh, you know, may make or break a combat for you, but it, it's probably not going to win or lose you the game by playing one feat, which is one of the reasons we let them regenerate, rather than have super feats where you just drop it uh, the minute you get in close combat. 
There is one caveat to all that, however, because at the end of the day, uh, slain is a cosmic battle in its heart of hearts, as I say, between tribes of the Earth Goddess and the Sour Priests, who are perverting the Earth magic for their own purposes. So there's this cosmic battle in the background that we, we want to be represented on the battlefield because Slain ultimately is the champion of the goddess. It's one of his main claims to fame. So, for example, the feet cards, are they're aligned. They're either sun-aligned or moon-aligned. And depending on the, yeah, the cosmic balance during your scenario, it might mean that one of those is more dominant than the other or takes precedent over the other one. So they, they can basically be, like, be negated, cancel out. All different kinds of interactions can occur depending on whether you've got sun cards, moon cards, and what cosmic balance is up to. So there is an extra dimension to it, which kicks back into magic, which is what we did with the other half of the cards. They're not called spells, they're called boons, because you're, you're asking for boons from the gods. And, of course, I haven't even explained the blood point system yet. <laughs> well, now, now is the time, clearly. Uh, the boons work off these things called blood points, and blood points are things that you earn by gaining the god's favour in a number of different ways. Whenever one of your champions activates, that will earn you a blood point. Gratuitously slaughtering some opponent, like doing loads more injuries than were necessary to kill them, <laughs> that will earn you a blood point. You can also earn them by controlling bits of terrain during a scenario. So there might be a, a sacred stone or an enchanted brook or something like that. But you can occupy and gain blood points from that as well. So there's various different means of getting hold of them. And what you use them for, you use them in scenarios for certain reasons. You also use them to power boons. So a boon might cost one, two, or three blood points to bring into being. And it could be a storm of, like, crows attack your enemies, or it could be a buff of some kind, or a healing for your friends, and so on and so on. So there, there's a number of spell cards. There's basically a number of spell lists within the cards. There's sour magic and there's earth magic, which, depending on what the character is, they draw from. Yeah, that sounds really cool. <laughs> I quite like the, the idea as well you were saying about the competing factions. Um, in fact, I think that is in the Time Killer, can I oh, say, yes. but it, it mentions about how when one side is prevailing, there's a kind of rebalancing. Yes. And that's a really interesting concept. So Yeah, this is it. When we read around it, you know, there is this whole thing of the cosmic balance and this sort of like meta conflict going on between the gods, of which Slain is a representative. Slaufeg on the opposing side, you know, is a representative of the, the maggot of corruption, Krom Kruak, and so on. And, and like most of the champions and heroes were the champions of their tribe, the goddess, something like that. So they, they, they fought for something greater. So we wanted to bring that feel into the game an awful lot as well. It, this isn't about cops and robbers or bounty hunting or something like that. It's about fighting for the gods. They're fighting for your people. Gav did a marvellous job with this, with the scenarios in particular and the campaign, because we put a lot in about uh, different sorts of sacred terrain and so on. And a lot of the scenarios themselves will tend to revolve around things like liberating a, a sacred site or sacrificing uh, particular points and, you know, basically spending more blood points to your god than the enemy can spend for theirs in the time allotted, or stealing sacred artifacts and things like that. So there's some nice character scenarios in there as well. It doesn't have a system like a strontium dog had. It's a bit more like just where they just fixed scenarios with, you know, variable contents rather than uh, a, a super integrated sort of system like it, well, like we had for strontium dog, for chicanery. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, about the scenarios in the campaign. Obviously, with the emphasis in the game, moving from range to close combat, when you were coming round to the scenarios, were you having to design them from scratch, or were you able to adapt some of the scenarios? I was just wondering how radical that was. No, we, we just went from scratch. We, we just went from scratch, because one of the things is we, we knew we needed to make position control quite important in the scenarios. So basically, you fought over something. You're trying to drive people away from something or protect something or get away with something so that it's, it's not just about running up to each other and hitting each other at the first opportunity. There's actually there's a little bit more tactical play than that to it. One of the changes that we made in the in combat in general, actually, because it is a point of range combat as well, is in the Age of Slain, you can basically give ground when you take an injury. And what that means is uh, you can't, Avoid the first injury you take, but for every other other injury, if you give you back off two inches, you can reduce the number of injuries you take. So generally, you can keep yourself down to just taking one injury at a time in close combat if you can back away. 
if you can't back away, then, you know, the gloves are off. <laughs> Sometimes you don't want to back away because you are protecting the Ogham stone or what have you, and you don't want to give up possession of it and so on. So that, that brings in a, a bit more of an interesting uh, interplay about hanging on to where you are, giving ground, surrounding people, cutting them off from their retreat becomes really important, or backing them up against a cliff or something like that, which is quite nice and dramatic in and of itself. Absolutely. So uh, it proved to be a, a good little change to it. And I'd say, and fit in with this idea of trying not to get locked into combat at the first opportunity, you know, in, at some spot in the board where it just becomes a dice rolling exercise. So there is a bit more tactical maneuvering going on. Cool. Just when you were mentioning about the cards there as well, I'm presuming they're very similar to the, the Armory and Chicanery cards and that there'll be the original artwork from the, the strips again. That's. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's again. I, a great part of the pleasure in doing two thirds of titles is like going, that one, that one, we have to put that on a card. <laughs> and is that again from the, across the whole arc, or is it more focused on the black and white classic period, which obviously you're drawn up on? It is across from the whole arc, but often, particularly on things like cards, black and white art works better because it's more nice when you sort of like shrink it down into a small space like that. So I can't remember, but I think most of them are actually black and white illustrations. To be honest, I actually think that applies to the comic itself. I, I find a lot of the, once it became colour, I didn't find the storytelling as clear. Particularly if there was some of the, there was a, a couple of artists that sprang to mind that were a bit more um, abstract. And I found some sometimes the storytelling was a lot, it was a lot harder to understand what was going on. So I can totally understand why that would be the, the case with those cards, <laughs> absolutely. I was wondering as well about the characters in the game, because one of the things that kind of struck me about that was different between Judge Dredd and Strontium Dog was in Strontium Dog, it was like all the characters were pretty unique. Even a lot of the lowly ones, they all had their own stats and so on. Whereas with Dredd, it was much more factional, where it was, you know, kind of because he does face a lot more generalised threats, <laughs> I suppose. Yes, absolutely. He's in a city that once upon a time was 800 million people. So, uh, yeah, a bit more of a cast of thousands situation going on there. So I was wondering how that affected the approach for Slain, if it was one or the other, or somewhere in the middle. <laughs> well, it's, it's one of those things, you, you read through the comics and you, you sort of like go, oh, we've got to have him as a character, we've got to have them as a character, we've got to have them as a character, and you just wind up with the list at the end of that, and then Paul goes, there's too many people on this list, or there's not enough people on this list. <laughs> and then you go and look for more, or cut the ones that you didn't really like that much, as the case may be. Slain kind of fell somewhere in the middle between that. What you get with Slain is you've got a number of extreme big characters that reoccur often. Slain himself, obviously, Bucko the Dwarf, his sidekick, are in just about all of them. Nest is a character who appears in quite a lot of them and has uh, got a big role. Well, I'm not saying a big role. She is in the Horned God book quite a lot because she's kind of the chronicler at that point. So she's she's fairly present. And then you've got Slough Fegg on the opposing side, who's kind of like the eternal enemy, in a way, and reoccurs throughout the entire series of Slain. Getting past that, though, the characters are a lot more occasional, but they are there, you know. There's, you know, Slain's first love, there's the kings of the other Earth tribes, we'll have the sacred treasures of the goddess and things like this, so there's a fair amount to hang your hat off. It was hardest finding villains, is what we found. There aren't that many of them that are detailed out, and many of them fall between before Slain's acts before they even get a name, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to dig fairly deep to find enough villains to go around and if truth be told it's still a little bit short on villains but uh, on the other hand with things like skull swords and so on you have got general bad guys that are quite tough um, you know skull sword leaders and so on so and the sort of the lesser sour magic practitioners as well so there, there were a fair number of things to go go on with when it came down to it, but we did struggle a little bit finding the villains. But there's a fairly well-rounded selection overall of different characters. Horned God was very good because it gave you know a great look for many other things, particularly like the the kings of the other Earth tribes and so on. So we've got a very coherent look going on for them. As soon as you're mentioning about the look of them, I was wondering what your personal favourite, um, I suppose, different factions and the miniatures themselves. What what your personal favourites were? <laughs> I've always had a bit of a soft spot for the Druid Priests and their skull swords, to be honest. They just look kind of cool to me. So, and Slough Fag, for that matter. So, they're, they're kind of my personal favourites, as, as loath as I am to admit it, because I always end up getting saddled with playing Slain in these games. But yes, the rotting boys are the ones that appeal to me the most. <laughs> I quite like the Fomorians personally, but 
I think that was more to do with my jump on point because the Fomorians were when I first discovered two thousand AD that was who was in it. So I, I really like I really like those those ones myself. But yeah, they all look they all look the part. <laughs> yeah, I, we included the Fomorians as like another faction. So there would be like a third option. Plus, they could, you know they can ally with dreams and stuff anyway. So it, it just added a little bit more diversity to the range to include some sea devils in there as well. And as you say, they do feature quite a bit as you know the other opponent the slime goes up against quite a lot. Aside from the dream priests and their skull swords, is Fomorians, bloody Fomorians, all the time. Yeah, and they reappear as well in the uh, big invasions. I'm sure they, they come back then as well. So it's not like they just appear in that kind of slain the king art. They do appear. I think probably more than that as well, to be honest. But yeah, I was glad to see they were in there <laughs> because yeah, it, it's good to have that extra faction as well to kind of mix things up. Always. I was wondering as well, um, just in terms of I know you're I'm not talking about release dates as such, but. Obviously, in the previous games, there was a, the rule books had a, a number of characters that weren't immediately available to buy, but became available in the kind of months after release. We can we expect the same thing with Slaying? And if so, what goodies are in the pipeline that won't immediately be available? I believe, that this is Paul's department, not mine, basically I believe that the idea is everything that we did a stat line for should appear as a, a model eventually. But that's an eventually thing. Don't know quite how they're getting on with the Judge Dredd stuff because they do seem to be doing pretty well on that actually. But again, that was the concept was that there'd be something for everything eventually that was in the book. Yeah, the Dread line is um, the book is complete. Same for Strontium Dog, right? Yeah, basically everything that's in the book you can you can get. And there's actually been one or two extras. The Clegs, I don't think they were in the book from memory. No, we we didn't do it for the book specifically because yeah, we didn't know whether to do the whole Judge Cal thing as a separate expansion. Ah, oh, right. Because basically you could, because you had plagues. And that, that was enough to go on to like, oh, it could make this a whole expansion to its own right. But the thing is, we just read there's so many different expansions you can do. Because mm. Apocalypse War is obviously the, the big one. You can solve the judges in there and all kinds of interesting mechs. So, but we shall see. I have no visibility on what they're doing on that front at the moment. Because, yeah, Slain was a, it was a fairly long gestation period for us, actually, because we kind of did the initial work on it. It got delayed a bit, so that we ended up going back to it like a year later and reworking things and working it up a bit further. And then having done that, uh, then COVID hit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that delayed things even further. Yeah, it was a shame that that, I'm, I'm assuming that kind of slowed down how quickly it could all get done. Yeah, well, this is why we've gone back to it, because you know, Warlord had to hang fire on it for a bit. So it had already been sitting around for us for a little while, and then it came up that they were going to be in a position to move on it. So I said, we, we took another swing through it and revised things and uh, worked on it some more, and then we just about handed it over when, uh, like, uh-oh, everything's going to slow down for the next two years, as it turned out. Yeah. So it's good to see it come out now. It is a slightly dim and distant memory, so please forgive me for any details I may have got wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and was it? Did you enjoy the process of? Because um, obviously you'd worked together on Strontium Dog, uh, reuniting with Gav for Slain. Yes, yeah, it, it's a genuine pleasure working with Gav. It really is. He did tr- terrific job, like I said, on the scenarios and the campaign system for Slain is really, really good as well. I really enjoy that too. He basically made it all about following the different gods and like winning boons from the gods for your actions or lack of them and gaining territories and so on. So it's it's got a really nice narrative to it. And kind of rounds things out very nicely. And um, how long is a campaign in Slain then? Or is it really kind of variable? You can have a short one or a, a longer one, depending on what you're, you're in for. Yeah, it's, it's kind of down to the players to set how long they want it to run for in broad terms. It's basically like a bit of a King of the Hill thing, where, if I remember rightly, and I have to go back a long way here, you're basically trying to get conquest points, is what it comes down to. And you can get them by like grabbing territories off other people or finding their sacred sites and things like that. And once one player is in like a conquering position, basically, he is the big daddy, has the Iron Crown. All the other players can play against them like once, try and defeat them, knock the crown off their head, and if they don't defeat them by that point, the campaign's over. So there is a, a kind of like full stop on it at a certain point. Yeah, so that all sounds very exciting, and it. So it'll be interesting to see how people get on with the game, and be please comment on the video if you want to do so, and let us know how you got on with it. Because I'm very curious to know how all well, the changes you've just outlined how that affects the the uh, system in general. So thank you very much for joining us. I really, I really appreciate you coming back on again to talk about Slain. That was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for having me. It's- 
always a great pleasure to come on and talk to another big fan of gaming in general and I say I really get a kick out of doing the 2000 AD games so it's just good to come and geek out really <laughs> yeah, for me too I know thank you very much so as I say uh, Slane is available now you can pick it up in shops check out let us know what you think so far as this channel is concerned we're going to be having more episodes of The Killing Strontium Dog The Killing uh, coming up it's getting towards the end of that campaign but there's still plenty more episodes so we've got that ongoing that's my pal Alan that's doing that and also there'll be some more uh, kind of live play Judge Dread miniatures game as well some more of that so Thanks again, Andy, for joining us, and until next time, keep on living the life of Die.